Our speaker this evening is Michael Schellenberger, and his topic is Why Environmentalists Will Save Diablo Canyon Nuclear Plant. He had a very important op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, that came out on, um, I think it was June 30th, is that right, June 30th? And uh, we have a few copies. If you see me or my wife, Margaret, afterwards, we'll give you a copy of it. Schellenberger was co-founder with Ted Nordhaus of the Breakthrough Institute, and he recently founded Environmental Progress. He's an environmental policy expert, and in 2008, he was named by Time Magazine as one of its heroes of the environment. He's the winner of the Green Book Award in 2008. This breakthrough book is a remarkable book, I think, and I highly recommend it. His writing has appeared in the Harvard Law and Policy Review, the Democracy Journal, the American Prospect, the New Republic, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times, and in many others. Time Magazine called this book prescient. It's the best thing that happened to environmentalism since Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, according to Wired Magazine. And in 2015, he joined 18 others, and he wrote what is called the Eco-Modernist Manifesto. You can Google this, and you can find it on the internet. But again, we have a few copies of this. And if you see either me or Margaret afterwards, we'll give you a copy. He grew up in Colorado. He received his bachelor's degree from Earlham College and a master's degree from UC Santa Cruz. He and his wife and two children live in the Bay Area, and he has long been an environmental activist. We've worked with him on a, several occasions, and this is part of what we think is our responsibility to keep in play all of these ideas. Because when we think about the major issues that we're confronted with, where it's cl whether it's climate change, shortage of food, shortage of fresh water, there are no silver bullets. These are what are called wicked problems. You can't solve them, but you can, if you have the right approach, manage them and keep them within bounds. And the solutions will take the form of portfolios of solutions that in the aggregate keep things within certain bounds. Please join me in welcoming Michael Schellenberg to the aquarium. And thanks, everybody, for coming. It's really a pleasure to be back here, my favorite aquarium in the world, um, with the, the, the best director. Thanks again for the introduction. This is a talk that I've been giving over the last few months, but it's a little bit different now because today we filed a, a legal motion with the state's California Public Utilities Commission asking them to suspend hearings on whether or not to close Diablo Canyon, uh, California's last nuclear plant. And so in the middle of this presentation is going to be a special treat for you, um, a description of some of the things that we discovered in the process of doing the research around Diablo Canyon that has to do with the early retirement of California's second to last nuclear plant. So I'm a longtime advocate for renewable power. I changed my mind about nuclear. I was an anti-nuclear activist for most of my life up until about 2009 to 2011, I started hanging out with people like Stuart Brand, who co-founded the Whole Earth Catalog, and others who said, you really got to take another look at nuclear. Uh, we really need um, all of our low carbon power options if we're going to deal with climate change. And, um, and, and more recently, as Jerry mentioned, you know, we started taking a look at the numbers because you hear a lot about how, well, you know, we might be losing nuclear power, but solar and wind are coming on so line that it really cancels it out. So, what we started to do uh, earlier this year was to just take a hard look at some of the data. And so the first thing that we discovered, let's see if I can push the right button, is, so this is global data. And what you can see here is that low carbon power has grown in absolute terms over the last 30 years. So you can see hydro is the biggest, nuclear second, wind and solar at the top. So these have all grown in absolute terms but you've seen that they've declined as a percentage of electricity globally from about 36% to something around 31%. And that's important because if you care about climate change, ultimately we need to have all of our power coming from sources that don't produce any, any carbon. And so some people have said, well, how much could for, 
and a half percentage points of global electricity, or four and a half uh, percentage points of global electricity be? Well, it turns out it's about 60 nuclear power plants the size of Diablo Canyon, or about 900 uh, farms the size of, of solar farms the size of Topaz, which is one of the world's largest. And you see, one of the main reasons that it's been declining as a, as a share of global electricity is just because because poor countries that use wood and dung as their primary source of energy have been moving towards fossil fuels. And that's understandable. They need to use modern energy. But there's another reason which has been hidden until some of our research, which is that there's one of those sources of, of low carbon power has been in decline in absolute terms. And that's, that's nuclear. You can see that it's declined from being um, about uh, almost 17% uh, of global electricity to uh, ten and a half percent, and also has declined in absolute terms as well. And you can see that the the loss of nuclear hasn't, in fact, been made up for by the increase of solar and wind. And so, what happens is that when we lose a nuclear power plant, in almost every case, it's replaced almost entirely by fossil fuels. So, in Vermont, when they lost Vermont Yankee, they suffered a nine percent loss in all of their clean electricity and that the renewables that were added didn't come anywhere close to making it up. So we see that dynamic at play both at those global scales but also at the state level. You can see that in the United States we lost four nuclear plants. They were prematurely retired in 2013, 2014, and it almost wiped out all of the power that we got from solar electricity last year. So I always point out if you love solar and you would like to see solar contributing to reducing pollution and carbon emissions, then you should not. You should want to keep your nuclear power plants online. Otherwise, all that great effort you've done will be wiped out. And in fact, right now, half of all nuclear power plants in the United States, nuclear reactors rather, are at risk of premature closure by 2013, which is really only 13 years away. If that happens, um, you could see that, um, well, actually, this is just for 15 of those plants. If we lost the 15 plants that are at immediate risk of being closed, we would lose about four times the power that we generate from solar. And if we lost all those 50% of our reactors in the United States, it would set back the EPA's clean power plan goals by 44%. So if you care about clean air, if you care about carbon emissions, we can't let all this nuclear go. And you can see here, what does that mean in concrete terms? How much power are we talking about? The, the pollution that would be added would be the equivalent of putting 37 uh, million more cars on the road. And uh, we totaled up the math around the world. How much power did we lose? How much nuclear did we lose over the last 10 years? How much could we lose? What we found is that there's three and a half times more nuclear capacity threatened today to be lost over the next um, 15 years than we lost over the last 10. So the, the situation isn't getting better. It's actually getting worse. Um, you know, it, it wasn't always this way. There, in the 1960s, this is uh, one of the Sierra Club directors, Will Seary, he had a very different vision of nuclear. He said, nuclear power is one of the chief long-term hopes for conservation. Cheap energy in unlimited quantities is one of the chief factors, allowing for a large, rapidly growing population to preserve wildlands, open space, and lands of high scenic value. With energy, we can afford the luxury of setting aside lands from productive uses. This was the mainstream environmentalist view in 1966. And you can see Will Seary, I guess to be a Sierra Club director, you have to be kind of a badass mountaineer. You know, if you get to be that level, then you have to have climbed the Matterhorn or something like that. So this is a very serious director. The Sierra Club board of directors voted to uh, support the construction of Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant in the mid-60s. It, it became controversial, but then it went to the membership, and the membership also voted to build Diablo Canyon. So something starts to change. Um, what is it? Well, in one of the finest histories of this era, the author who was at the University of Wisconsin at the time writes, in the 1950s and 60s, the discredited theories of Malthus were taken off the shelf and put back to work. Humanity had to restrict its demands on nature to avoid catastrophe. Sierra Club board members subscribed to this Neo-Malthusian outlook. Would you raise your hand if you've heard of Malthus? Anybody? Has anybody heard of him? About a third of the room, Malthusian? What's that? Robert Thomas, Robert Thomas Malthus. So, Robert Thomas Mullis was um, a, an economist in the early 1700s who wasn't a huge fan of people, I'll put it that way. And so he said, he said look, um, what's going to happen is there's, the people are being born faster than we're growing food, we're making food. And so um, we're going to run out of food and people will starve. He didn't have any evidence for that, but like I said, he just he didn't like people very much. So he said, 
we're going to run out of food, people are going to die, so therefore the ethical thing to do would be to have people die now so that there's fewer people who die in the future. This is known as utilitarian ethics. Um, and that sounds kind of like, you might be like, that doesn't make sense because we've been growing more food. Um, but he was you know, very persuasive. And the idea became very important when Britain needed to justify its policies towards Ireland in, uh, during the Great Irish uh, uh, Famine. People think of it as just a potato blight that made Irish starve. But in fact, Ireland was exporting food to Britain at the time while many uh, hundreds of thousands of Irish were, were dying. So Malthus's ideas were very important. Um, in that sense. And then they come back then in the post-war era in the United States and elsewhere. In fact, there's two books that come out in 1948 that are really the key Malthusian texts. One of them is called Road to Survival, and the other is Our Plundered Planet. And they kind of put Malthus's ideas to work for people that thought they were trying to take care of nature, trying to save the environment. And the idea was that we are going to run out of food, people are going to starve, um, and that we needed to constrict and sacrifice and, and restrict our consumption uh, so that that didn't happen. But it also had a, had a darker side, which involved um, uh, a view towards uh, poorer countries like India, which I'll get to in a minute. So these ideas were picked up, again, 1966, such a critical year, by another Sierra Club director named David Brower, he wrote, if a doubling of the state's population in the next 20 years is encouraged by providing the power resources for this growth, California's scenic character will be destroyed. More power plants create more industry, and that in turn invites greater population density. So really the opposite of what Will Seary was saying that same year. Well, who's right? Well, I, I don't think there's any question about it in terms of the data. We now know that with higher levels of energy consumption, people can live in cities because cities require a lot of energy. You can uh, you know, free up your countryside. It used to be that 70, 70% of all humans were, were farmers, even in the United States and around the world now, just under 1% of us are. So the countryside, we grow more food on less land, people move to cities, and we're able to return the country to grasslands and forests. And in fact, the United States wildlife has been coming back for about 100 years. You stop using wood as fuel. So that is, that is sort of what we know now, 50 years later with all the data. At the time, you can give Brower uh, the benefit of the doubt, though it's worth noting that Will Seary had the right idea all along. Um, 1968, two years later, David Brower publishes this book called The Population Bomb by a Stanford biologist who, like Malthus, ground his ideas in science. He said the science shows that we're going to run out of food and everybody's going to die, and therefore we should, for example, stop sending food to poor countries. We should help poor countries to... Uh, sterilize people so that there's fewer children. Um, not all of these ideas are terrible. Family planning and, and birth control are all, can all be very positive things, but it had a dark and a very coercive aspect to it. And it's notable when you pick up this book now, it's quite shocking to read the first few pages because then Ehrlich is describing how he goes to India and they're going from the airport you know, into Delhi and, and he's describing people like animals, really. You know, it's a kind of dehumanizing worldview. So this is sort of coming up in the 60s. This is, by the way, some people say that when I, I get accused, people say, accuse me, I, I consider myself a little bit of a hippie myself. People accuse me when I, when I criticize anti-nuclear folks as hippie bashing, but there was nothing hippie about any of this. The hippies were not involved in making these arguments, so don't blame the hippies for, for Malthusianism. Um, this is a, the activist within the Sierra Club that led the effort to close Diablo Canyon, Martin Litton. He said, this is from the same book, Sierra Club member Martin Litton favored a drastic reduction in population to halt encroachment on parkland. Asked if he worried about nuclear accidents, he replied, no, I really didn't care because there's too many people anyway. I think that playing dirty if you have a noble end is fine. Now, they, prob they didn't have the sophisticated focus group and polling research methods that we have today, but they had a sense that that message wasn't really popular that um, trying to you know, prevent people from coming to California and making energy more, ex more expensive and more scarce, they had an inkling that that wasn't a very popular idea. So they deliberately shifted tax and they decided to instead scare people about nuclear power. And so this is not like a wild theory. They interview people later and they, they, they say they did this. This is uh, Doris Sloan. Uh, she said, if you're trying to get people aroused about what is going on, you use the most emotional issue you can find. Um, and so that is obviously radiation. This history is completely misread. There's so many people that say, 
that, that think that nuclear was going along fine until Three Mile Island happened and then everything changed. Not true at all. You can see the roots of this are really in the mid-60s. Um, by the time you get to Three Mile Island in 1979, it had the good fortune of happening the week um, after the China Syndrome came out, which is about a nuclear plant that is like Diablo Canyon, is, is on the California coast, is near faults, and the idea of the movie, of course, is that there's a meltdown, and then the melting hot radioactive li you know, liquid, I suppose, just burns a hole through the earth and ends up in China, because China's underneath California, I guess, right? No, China's not under California. So there's a bunch of things that were not technically very accurate about this movie, um, but it is a pretty good movie, actually. I just watched it recently. Um, I think it's important. The, the thing I want you to remember about this, though, is that this was not like an innocent, like, oh, we thought radiation was fine, and then, oh, wow, radiation's not fine. There was a long history of studying radiation, of radiation science. Of, uh, sometimes people say, well, we just don't know about radiation. It's not true. We've been studying radiation in, in great depth. And that the, the driver of this was both this issue of not wanting too much power, not wanting abundant power. Some of it was coincidental because the Sierra Club was in California. They were opposing power plants here. They just happened to be nuclear plants. But I think there's something else that was going on, which is that nuclear, once you have nuclear power, and the people, and people understood this in the 1950s, humans will never run out of energy. It's just, it's, it's, it's for all intents and purposes, un, unlimited. People sometimes say to me, well, there might be limits to uranium. We now can get uranium out of the oceans. The Japanese have proven that, which actually makes nuclear a renewable resource. Um, but beyond that, I think most of us think that before you ever try to get to uranium harvesting out of the oceans, we will be on to advanced nuclear power plants that use the 98% of the energy that's still in the spent fuel, which we call waste, as fuel for next generation reactors. But but I think it's important that the threat that nuclear posed to this Malthusian vision is that it was unlimited energy, that it, it ended all technical arguments around scarcity. Because if you have unlimited energy, then you can desalinate water, you can create fertilizer, and you are not going to run out of food. So Malthusianism as a worldview, even though it was always on pretty shaky ground scientifically, was really demolished by nuclear. And that's why I believe um, this particular brand of Malthusian uh, the, the thinking had to go after nuclear. And in fact, one other thing about it, sometimes people say, well, Three Mile Island, that really, you know, that really showed how dangerous nuclear was. It really shows the opposite, right? You have this full meltdown of a reactor. I mean, it just, the thing is so hot, it melts, lots of coolant, and n nobody's injured. Nobody dies. Like, nothing happens. In fact, what's so striking um, about that that incident, and this is not my observation, this is a, a historian of the era, is that the media coverage was focused on what they thought could have happened. This is not what journalists are taught to cover. Journalists are not taught to cover what could have happened. They're taught to cover what did happen, who, what, where, when, why, how, the basic facts. That all went out the window because of all of this important intellectual work done against nuclear in the years that preceded it. So with this as the background, we have had, um, Many states around the country put into place clean energy standards. And the interesting thing about these clean energy standards is everywhere they exclude nuclear, including in California. And so I think people, and I'll show a little bit later, nuclear is not a popular technology, but I don't think people understand that these clean energy standards um, exclude our largest source of clean power in the United States. And in that environment, it's very hard for nuclear to compete against heavily mandated or subsidized technologies. And you can see it's excluded even though, according to the United Nations Gov Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which did the most comprehensive review of the carbon intensity of different energy sources, finds that nuclear actually has, um, produces less carbon uh, than even solar. And you can see it's tied right there at the end with wind. But this is the real issue. Nuclear is just scary for people. Um, you don't really have to do a public opinion poll to figure that out, but it's nice to see that people have. Um, and this is a global poll. It was done in December 2014, and they find remarkably similar attitudes around the world. Um, and so solar and wind are hugely popular. So if you want to be a popular person, uh, don't be a pro-nuclear advocate, I'm telling you. Um, 
you can see nuclear is just a little bit more popular than coal, although I don't even think that's accurate because this is just measuring conscious perceptions. I think that people don't, have, people don't wake up in the middle of the night having a nightmare about coal plants, at least not most people. Um, but I think everyone has had some fear of nuclear war, or this association with nuclear. So, so nuclear is just unpopular, and I think that unpopularity underlies everything that we have, all the problems that nuclear has, um, including those discriminatory policies. And that um, you know, lack of popularity is there, even though it's actually the safest way to make reliable power. I sometimes say, I say this once, I say this all the time, people come up to me and they say, well, you said nuclear was safe. I said, no, I didn't say it was safe. I said it was the safest way to make reliable power because I don't think anything is safe. I actually, at one point I just pulled, it's a fascinating, you go to the occupational injury hazard data. You know, people die falling out of bed. I swear to God, they do. People die falling out of bed. They die falling downstairs. People die in a lot of very strange ways, crushed in machines is like my favorite category. Um, Basically, nobody dies from nuclear. You know, you have uh, a few dozen firefighters that die putting out the fire at Chernobyl. And Chernobyl is this really magnificent example of just like the worst possible nuclear disaster. I don't know how it could get any better than that. It, the reactor is on fire. There's no containment dome, and it's just spewing radioactive particles in the atmosphere, strontium and cesium and other, uh, um, other dangerous substances in the atmosphere. And then what happens is... They do studies. In fact, uh, someone I know at Imperial College um, in London has done the Chernobyl Tissue Bank, where she's been taking tissue samples from many, many people around Europe and then tracking them over years. And she says, bluntly, um, we can't see any impacts of Chernobyl beyond the kids that got thyroid cancer because the Soviet authorities failed to give them iodine tablets. But even for them, it's a 1% mortality. She can't find any evidence of um, lasting mortality. Nonetheless, the World Health Organization has said, well, if you use a particular way of measuring it, 9,000 people will, over, say, a 100-year period, die prematurely from Chernobyl-related cancers. Well, you have to put that in contrast. There's, there's 7 million people die prematurely from air pollution every year. So what the World Health Organization says is 9,000 over, say, 100 years. That's why it's so... That's why almost all the deaths here you see are from pollution, not from accidents. So that is the data. This is the British Medical Journal Lancet, and it's not the only study that shows this. So the data is not, there's not a controversy over what is in the science. People talk about the waste. The first, I, the other thing I say about the nuclear waste, it is the best waste that we get out of any way of making electricity. That sounds so great. What? Well, the reason is easy to understand. There's so little material. So waste is what comes out of any productive process. So the function of the materials that go in, there's so little materials that are used in nuclear, so little steel and concrete compared to renewables, which require huge amounts of steel and concrete. And this also goes for the fuel. People say, what about the uranium fuel? Tiny amounts of uranium. You know, this amount of uranium could power my whole life. Um, so tiny amounts of waste. And people say, well, it's really dangerous. It's a very strange thing to say, to call waste really dangerous. It is, I think, potentially dangerous, but it doesn't hurt anybody or kill anybody, and it just kind of sits there. This is at Pilgrim. Um, I, get, I used to get most of my scientific training from The Simpsons, so I used to think that waste was liquid and green, right? And when you ask people, like, what are you worried about with waste, they say, well, I'm worried it'll be on, like, on the truck, you know, the truck on the dirt road. You kind of see it, and then, the, and then the barrel falls over, and then the green waste goes into the field, and it goes into people's water supplies, and we all get three eyes or heads or whatever. So the first is that the waste apparently is not green. I've been told that it's not green. And it's actually not liquid at all. It's the, the what we call the high level waste is the old fuel rods. It's the old fuel rods and the, the containment that we only, our machines are only so good as to get like 3% or 2 or 3% of the power out of them. So they just sit there and then people go, well, they're going to be around for so long. I don't think that's true either. Bill Gates and a whole bunch of other companies are racing to see who can build the, re, the nuclear reactors that use this waste as fuel. But even, let's just say, thought experiment, that humans did have to babysit that waste for a very long time. I think it's a pretty small price to pay. When I think about the waste that I worry about, gigantic islands of plastic floating in the ocean, or the waste that's in the atmosphere as chemical contaminants or pollution that are uncontained, this is waste, this is the only waste that is internalized into the productive process. So you're actually in control of the waste. 
So if, even if you did have to babysit that waste for 10,000 years, pretty small price to pay for a, a huge impact that humans have and all of the benefits that come from having a high energy society, including cities, the return of nature in the countryside, and whatnot. You know, people sort of say, well, what if it, you know, I was with the San Diego Union Tribune reporters, and they said, well, what if those containers, if there's a problem with the containers, you know, well, then you would need to fix the containers. You know, <laughs> these are all, these are power, these are big power plants, they have machines that need to be replaced, and that's gonna be an important point when we get to San Onofre. This is, I think, one of the most, um, Beautiful, I call it the second most beautiful nuclear plant. Diablo Canyon is the most beautiful. Um, you know, this is something that you would think would be an environmental ideal. You know, a tiny footprint. There's no pollution coming out of these plants. The waste is perfectly internalized and managed. Uh, the, only thing, the only thing that comes out of it that you could consider calling pollution is the hot water. I don't really consider it, um, you know, a kind of a waste. And so what happened to us that we see this thing that is the safest, cleanest form of power and we decide that there's something really fundamentally wrong with it. So what's happening in California? This is a picture of our electricity grid during the day, sometimes in the spring of, last, of this year. This was a graph that was created by the radio station KQED in San Francisco. And you can see that we have added so much solar, which I've long been an advocate of, that actually that red part on the top means that there's just times of the day when it's really, really sunny in California. There's so much solar that if, if we, have to, we have to cut it off coming from the solar farms because otherwise it would overwhelm the grid. The electrical grid, which some engineers say is the most important invention that humans ever created, is perfectly efficient because if you're, creating, if you're putting too much power onto the grid than people are using, then you have blowouts. And if you don't have enough power, then you have brownouts or blackouts. So, so you have to, we've had to curtail solar because we have so much solar. Well, the obvious solution to that is to get rid of nuclear power, right? Well, that, that's sort of what um, uh, we've decided in California. You can see nuclear is there on the bottom green. At least they gave it the color green. Um, though I think it probably refers to the green liquid waste rather than the, the ecological benefits. So the idea is, well, we should just get rid of the nuclear then. Because then we can have a little, we can have a little bit more renewables. So there was an effort by Pacific Gas and Electric, which owns Diablo Canyon, to get nuclear added to the state renewable portfolio standard, which is one of the reasons that they're arguing they need to close the plant. And that idea was rejected by everybody, including the Governor Brown, his administration, and everybody else who say they care about climate change. So you can see the problem that gets created with solar and wind is that the sun goes down right when everybody comes home from work and turns on all their lights and their, their everything in the, you know, the washing machine and the, you know, the, the dishwasher. And again, in my, in my family, like you come home from work and you just got to turn every light on the house on, right? That's important to have all the lights on at the same time. So everybody's doing that in California. And so you've got to ramp up huge amounts of power at that very moment. And people go, well, don't we have batteries that can do that? We don't have batteries that can do that. What we do is that we flood much more natural gas onto the, uh, to start generating more um, gas. But the problem is then we don't like to have pipelines in California. So we stop building sufficient pipelines. So um, this is, by the way, the great Diablo Canyon, just up the coast. I'll, I'll let me just stop that boring grid conversation. Just say, I did not Photoshop that whale onto this photo. That is an actual humpback whale uh, breaching. Um, I interviewed UC Santa Cruz biologist Peter Raimundi who, um, who studies this area, and he says that the tide pools around the plant are the most pristine in California. And it's really easy to understand why. There's not tens of thousands of school kids that come every day. You know, they touch the anemones, and they're grabbing sea stars, and they're tromping all around. I mean, we love our kids to get those marine environments, but it just, it, it hammers them. Pristine marine environment, the only significant ecological impact, according to the scientists, is the fish larvae and eggs that get sucked into the plant. Um, however, they can't see any change in the fish population because the fish population is so variable during the year. But they came to an agreement on this issue that they would build an artificial reef like they did at San Onofre, and they would set aside some land for conservation. When I learned this, I, when I was investigating this in January, I said, let me see if I understand this. In order to save this plant, we have to have more land conservation and more ocean biodiversity. That's what you're saying the cost of saving this plant is. And he said, yeah, that's right. That's what they would have to do. And they worked out an agreement in 2000 
And there was some, you know, the company didn't want to spend as much money as the bio, marine biologists would. We're all familiar with that. But they were like $30 million apart, which when it comes to power plants is not a lot of money. So they're very close to that. PG&E went bankrupt. The whole thing went away. It's come back and is now being used as an excuse to shut the plant. So let's get back to what happens when everybody turns on the lights and there's no more sun. So you have to flood the grid with all sorts of new natural gas powered um, electricity and you have to, where are you gonna put all that gas though because you don't have enough pipeline structure. So what we did is we started stuffing it in the side of this mountain called Aliso Canyon. So you just start jamming the gas in there. It's on a place called Porter Ranch. And then, you know, somebody tripped on a rock or something, or I don't know, they dropped their wrench, and then this uh, 500,000 cars worth of methane gas goes up into the atmosphere. This is an infrared photo taken. So people sort of say, well, don't we have magic batteries? We don't have magic batteries, it turns out. We have a very limited amount of utility scale storage, and, but mostly we back things up with natural gas. And you would, think, you would think, well, after this happened, they must have closed that down, right? That, that certainly doesn't exist anymore. Nope, we are still stuffing gas into Aliso Canyon. Um, so this is the, the hard choice. So I don't think it's that hard of a choice. But if you don't have nuclear, you go to gas. Um, and so you can see when we lost San Onofre, sometimes called Songs, which is kind of the prettiest name for a nuclear power plant, Songs, um, when it was shut down, uh, it was, had a bigger impact in terms of loss of clean energy than even the loss of hydro from the drought. And you can see there a 50% decline in nuclear. We just lost you know, two big reactors and is replaced um, almost entirely with natural gas, uh, the equivalent of adding two million cars to the road. And you can see this is a very extraordinary number, I think. So this is carbon emissions from, the, uh, from making electricity in California and you can see that um, they were going down. So between 2000 and 2010, it declined 20 million tons. From 2011 to 2014, it went up 10 and a half million tons. Um, and it's and like I showed before, it's, uh, the biggest cause was the closure of San Onofre. And you can see that we did clean up the amount of power we import from out of state, mostly by moving from coal to natural gas, which is helped by having really cheap natural gas. But it just it was all wiped out by the increase in power sector emissions. And people say, what about solar? It didn't make it up. You can see here um, the loss from 2011 to 2012. I still have reporters and people that cover this issue say to me, they go, well, that increase in pollution was temporary, right? No, it was not temporary. It is continuing. It's still in the data that we were at higher emissions in that uh, power sector. And if we lose Diablo Canyon and the same thing happens, which it almost certainly will, then we'll go down even further. So you can see here, um, just four different ways of slicing up time, you know, just so you don't think I'm choosing randomly. Emissions are going down during every period except for this period after 2011. And in fact, sometimes people think, people think climate legislation has a bigger impact. It gets like the front page of the newspapers, but these other factors, like the closure of a nuclear plant, significantly outweigh what happens with legislation. So AB 32 is climate legislation. Emissions actually declined four times faster before that legislation passed. And if we lose Diablo, we'll lose one-fifth of all of our clean power. 1.6 million cars on the road. And you can just see the green line is clean energy. The red line is natural gas. We're just becoming incredibly, I think, dangerously dependent on a single fuel. When I first started learning about electricity, the thing that everybody, all the wise, guy, all the wise men would say is, don't get too dependent on any one source of energy. Especially not natural gas, that stuff is crazy. Prices go up and down and you can't plan for it. Um, and, and you know, um, the current head of the California Public Utilities Commission, when he was asked about Diablo King, he said, well, you know, the grid, it's not, it doesn't depend on any single plant. You know, we have a lot of solar coming online. But Diablo Canyon produced 14 times more power than our largest solar farm. So sure, maybe not any, we're not depending on any single solar farm, but um, Diablo Canyon goes offline and we know what happens. You can see here just how it's almost as much, produces almost as much power as all of our solar in the state, more than all of our wind. And you can see there's been a, a higher cost than we've been seeing in, in our electricity rates just because natural gas has been so cheap. And everybody expects natural gas to go up. So now let's have a brief interlude to talk about San Onofre, which is this fascinating case um, that I started researching as we filed a motion with the California Public Utilities Commission. I'm just curious, raise your hand if you know what the California Public Utilities Commission is. Have people, do people know what that is? Have they heard of it? 
So this is just this extraordinarily powerful agency where all the commissioners are appointed by the governor, approved by the Senate, that determines how, determines kind of what happens with how we produce power. It also determines other utilities, but they have a lot of power in terms of what plants come online, which plants go offline. The plant in the background is San Onofre. It was like right there on the beach. Um, they had a problem. They had a small radioactive uh, leak, not enough for anybody to be hurt. They actually um, shut down both of the reactors as precautionary. And a year into that, the company, Southern California Edison, was negotiating with NRC to try to restart the reactors at maybe a little bit lower level, like 70%. Um, the evidence, I believe, is very clear. I just read all through the emails and everything else that the company was not intending to shut this plant down. It was intending to restart it. And then something very interesting happens, um, which is that some monkey business starts to go down. The head of the CPUC it, um, is now under federal and state criminal investigation. This is Kamala Harris, who was recently asked about it. She says, yeah, no, it's still going on. We're still investigating it. Um, and it all starts with these two gentlemen. This is Michael Peavy. He's the former head of the CPUC. He's a former executive at Southern California Edison. And Stephen Pickett is also a former Southern California Edison. These two guys are in Poland together. They're on one of these little junkets traveling around the world. You know, they drink this thing called Blue Label Johnny Walker. I never heard of Blue Label Johnny Walker. Apparently, it's really expensive. Um, and they're having a great time. And then PV does something very interesting, is that Pickett is supposed, his bosses are like, go talk to PV and tell him we're working on songs on San Ofre. And he, sits, he approaches Michael PV, and Michael PV goes, goes, no, 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 no. He basically goes, you got to shut the plant down. And here's how you're going to do it. And he sits there and proceeds to dictate to the, the Southern California executive, Southern California Edison executive, what the deal should be. And it's a deal he can't refuse. It's $3.3 billion of ratepayer money, just 1.4 of investor money. That's If you're an executive, you're trying to minimize what investors have to pay, make ratepayers pay more. Pickett is like listening to this. He's trying to follow. It's got this, you know, PV is literally dictating it. Pickett grabs a, 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 a hotel notepad and starts just writing down what PV is saying. And he writes this whole page. And there's um, two pages of it. And you can see in the light blue is Michael PV's handwriting. This After Pickett took these notes, he gives them to PV. PV takes them home and the federal agents confiscate them as part of their criminal investigation. Um, the second page is even more interesting, though. So, the, so what is the criminal activity that's being investigated here, the suspected criminal activity, I, should, I hasten to add, um, is PV, who was in his mid-70s at the time, kind of looking for his next gig. He'd been there for 12 years. He says, I want you guys to give $5 million a year to a little research center to study greenhouse gas emissions and as part of this deal. And he, then he gets the memo back. And then PV, you can see right there, he crosses out. He says, forget $5 million a year. I want $10 million a year to go to this little research institute center. And the suspicion is that PV would be on the board, which he did, in fact, join, and that he would have somebody else to pay for his Johnny Walker Blue. Um, and for his hotels and whatever. That's the suspicion anyway. So this was sort of the smoking gun of some criminal activities. What happens next? Um, so the way this gets reported, though, is that the Southern California Edison has pulled one over. It's called, they call it regulatory capture. The idea is that the corporation has captured the agency. But when you read all of the documents, What's so impressive is that it's something close to the opposite. The regulator is going to the company and saying, this is what you should do. And he says, if you don't take this offer, you can't refuse of $3.3 billion of ratepayer money. And you come back later, uh, it's going to be much worse for you. There's a carrot and a stick there. So Pickett is now under investigation. He's being interviewed by a federal agent. Um, that's my red. I wrote that. I was like, I wrote on the on the PDF. I was like, it was PV's idea. Why doesn't people see this? So he says, um, he says, well, I was, meet, you know, I was meeting with PV, and I didn't know what he, I didn't know this was going to go there, and he just starts to dictate the terms of the deal. And you might say, well, okay, maybe he's spinning it later, you know, um, and that really, you know, maybe it was Pickett's idea. 
However, um, um, actually, I'm sorry, uh, let me, one more detail, also from the same testimony. Pickett says um, that um, I needed to involve a guy named John Giesman. This is the first time John Giesman shows up. I'd never heard of John Giesman. Has anybody heard of John Giesman in here, right? Um, he says, go deal with John Giesman. Well, who is John Giesman? John Giesman is an anti-nuclear activist who is really hated by Southern California Edison. So it's a very curious reference, which we'll come back to. So Pickett says this, well, look, maybe he's lying. Um, um, so then they go get testimony from this guy. He's the president of Southern California Edison, Ron Litzinger. He's not in Poland with these guys. Pickett comes back. He goes, Ron, I had this amazing meeting with PV. He told me we should shut down songs, and here's the deal, and he emails it to him. So, well, maybe everyone's lying or making that up. This is Pickett's statement. He said, um, um, you know, um, I was concerned for a number of reasons about what I heard from my colleague Pickett. At the time, we were actively pursuing approval from Nuclear Regulatory Commission to restart one of the reactors. I believed it was damaging and counterproductive to entertain PV's idea while Southern California Edison was pursuing restart. So this is the opposite of what the press coverage has said. The press coverage has said that this was sort of something that Southern California Edison wanted to do. So now the Southern California Edison is saying, no, it wasn't our idea at all. It was PV's idea. OK, maybe they're lying. However, something very interesting happens. We get an email that was sent from this guy, Litzinger, a month after that famous Poland meeting to his fellow executives, where he says exactly what he reports later. And so maybe he, you know, like knew two years before federal agents interviewed him that he would be interviewed and that he had to write some email, but it's kind of, that would require a lot of leaps of logic. A simpler explanation is that he really was doing what he's saying in this email. Let me give you a closer look. He says, um, he reports, Picky, he's, this is uh, the, the head of, of the company saying, said PV feels strongly about Giesman again. I merely respond, his testimony shows him to be a bomb thrower. And then PV says something very, very interesting. He says, PV said he is smart and could be trusted at least as long as he was in a superior position as a regulator. But he's not in a superior position as a regulator. He's an anti-nuclear activist. Why is, why is he being raised by PV? Who is John Giesman? Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility. I actually debated him two weeks ago. I had no idea who he was. And after I read these documents, just coincidentally, I was like, this is the most interesting person um, in this whole episode. So I created a little timeline of his career. And you can see that in 1979, when he was 29 or so, he was very close with Jerry Brown and that group. And he was very quickly one of the brightest, brightest sharpest guys in the room. So Jerry appoints him to be executive director of the California Energy Commission, which is one of the most powerful agencies in the state. He then disappears, comes back, he then joins the uh, utility reform consumer group in the 90s. Um, also was very active in democratic state politics, helps on Jerry Brown's run for governor. And then, interestingly, he is appointed somehow in 1998, I don't know if it's by Pete Wilson or whoever, I can't find any record of it, and he's on the power exchange, which is the main agency that is, over, that is at the center of the California energy crisis. That falls apart. He comes out smelling like roses. The governor has to resign. The governor is thrown out of office. He is then appointed back to the California Energy Commission. And in 2011, his name was floated as Jerry Brown's top choice to be on the CPUC. But Jerry Brown doesn't choose Giesman for the, CE, for the CEC. Instead, he sticks with PV. And I haven't interviewed a single person who thinks that Brown doesn't exercise very tight control over the CPUC. So there's a very strange set of events going on here. Um, then Giesman, in the whole process of this negotiation, kind of sort of out of the blue says, hey, somebody ought to study greenhouse gases, you know? And so the San Diego Union Tribune calls him up and goes, why were you advocating for PV's proposal if you say you weren't in on it? And he says, well, I didn't, I didn't say how much money it should be or where the money should go. Um, so what happens next? Um, PV's house is um, raided by agents. The CPUC is raided by agents. Um, so obviously, that's a great time to celebrate PV, right? So two months after the scandal goes down, 
They organize a gala celebration, a black tie event in San Francisco to celebrate him. Because you know, he had resigned in disgrace, so celebrating him a month later is a great idea. And it's a strange thing. You would think, like, wouldn't you wait like eight months for the whole controversy to blow, blow over? They don't. They want to celebrate him right then. And so for me as an outside observer, and all these co-hosts are donating to this event, for me looking at it, I go, this is a way of signaling that there will be continuity at the CPUC, that there will be no change or reform. It was organized by Susan Kennedy, who was Schwarzenegger's chief of staff. A few months after that, she gets a battery contract worth about $100 million. Um, there are now 120 emails between the governor's office, the former head of the CPUC, and the current head of the CPUC that are being kept secret, um, that they won't release them, even though they may contain evidence of criminal activity. It's gone to court. Um, the, judge, uh, the judge that reads this is outraged. He says, you've got to release these emails. Um, there's a bill in the legislature that would require these emails to be released. Brown vetoes it. Um, the legislators lecture the new head of the CPUC, and they say, you, your effort to reform this commission can't happen as long as you keep these emails secret. The emails are still secret. And the whole time, they're promising that they're cleaning up the agency. Then the judge says, this is a big deal. This is not a trivial issue. Um, it's going to come out. It's either going to be horribly painful, or you can just do the right thing now. Withholding records of allegedly ex parte secret deals resulting in shifting $3.3 billion of utility losses to ratepayers cannot possibly be a function of the CPUC. The core values of a democracy is the right of citizens to know the actions of public officials. Still, the emails are not released. They finally had a bill. They thought they were going to get it done. The last day of the legislative session last week, they just, dang it. They just ran out of time and they couldn't get the bill done. Isn't that a funny coincidence? And then another funny coincidence is that hours later, the courts, which are inside a court of appeals to rule on the emails, they decide to reject the appeal to release the emails. So you can see this is Mike Gatto. He's, his voting record shows him to be the most independent legislator in the legislature. Well, he's turned out, so we've, he's not going to be a problem anymore either. Um, two PUC reform bills die. Emails will stay secret. This was all last week. Um, so it's a kind of funny situation. It would be a funny situation for me to go to this agency, which is under a federal and state criminal investigation that's withholding 120 secret emails that maybe have evidence of criminal activity, and go to them and pretend like they're kind of you know, honest abes to decide the case of Diablo Canyon. So we decided not to do that. Instead, um, my friend James Hansen, the climate scientist, and about 60 other of the world's most famous climate scientists and environmentalists wrote an open letter to Governor Brown where we said, given the serious harm to the environment that would flow from Diablo's closure, we're deeply troubled by the lack of democratic process. It was decided in secret negotiations. Um, saying this proposal to the CPUC is an institution that's struggling with a crisis of credibility is a bad idea. So today, we filed a motion with the CPUC. There's some irony in this. We asked the commission to not decide on this because they're too corrupt and need to be reformed. Um, we shall see how that uh, goes. So I'll wrap up. Um, we're talking about, I would, we call it, people call us new environmentalists. The truth is, if you go back to Will Siri, some ways we're the original environmentalists. We recognize that you need Concentrations of humans' activities, cities, power density, produce more power using less nature. Very simple idea. It's uh, Will Siri, it's also Ansel Adams who recognized, the great Sierra photographer recognized that nuclear power was essential. Here, Jim Hansen at, in his mid-70s is going around the country with me to try to keep nuclear plants open, which are being forced closed by a, a very powerful set of opponents. And we're getting support just kind of you know, responding to all of our work. Robert Downey Jr., after we were in the Wall Street Journal, said it's like half the people who were saying no nukes are now realizing nuclear is the best way to go for energy for the future. I think it's natural to re-examine your beliefs as you age up. Nice little gift from the best paid actor in the world. Hillary Clinton, who was uh, being attacked by Bernie Sanders, who thinks we should shut down all nuclear plants, like instantly, and, and thinks that that's a climate plan. 
Hillary Clinton says proposals to shut down nuclear put ideology ahead of science and make it harder and more costly to build a clean energy future. We have been meeting these amazing people who, who would know. They were environmentalists, all three of these women. They hated nuclear. They were engineers. You know, they were at, like in class. They were asked to debate nuclear, or Sarah Spath in the middle, who's 25, saw an inconvenient truth when she was 15, right? I mean, you're like, whoa. Um, and then, like a lot of nerds, you know, they go home from a major movie and then they run calculations. I don't know, it's not me. Um, and they ran the numbers and they were like, yeah, we have, if we're going to save the world from climate change, it has to be nuclear power. Like, that's just kind of nerd climate logic. So they've all become nuclear engineers. Sarah Spath, actually worked in the wind industry and decided that wind couldn't scale because it just doesn't produce power enough at the time. They have started something called Mothers for Nuclear to make the environmental case. They say that the industry, the nuclear industry, also has to change its act. That their nuclear is not going to survive as a technology until the industry understands that they have a transcendent moral purpose in this world and for people to understand that the industry is committed to making a better world. And that's their work, not mine. We, though, um, we got this issue of the war on nuclear on the front page of the New York Times, front page of the Wall Street Journal, and then we did a sit-in at the Natural Resources Defense Council, the misnamed Natural Resources Defense Council in San Francisco. I tried very hard to get arrested. I mean, it was my big civil disobedience opportunity. I announced my civil disobedience. I read everything you're supposed to do. If you're going to commit civil disobedience, you know, you're not supposed to be sneaky about it. You're supposed to be like, I'm going to commit civil disobedience. And so I did that. and. I sat there, and in San Francisco, it turns out it's really hard to get arrested for civil disobedience. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I'm like, Eric, call 911 again. You know, he's calling the cops. Like, uh huh. So your buddy's, he's blocking the entrance. Is that right? Yeah, he's blocking it. Like, uh huh. And he wants to be arrested. Is that the idea? Yeah. Uh, so they just waited us out, um, and they let everybody go out the back door. So next time, by the way, we're gonna block both doors. Um, and, and I mean, would it surprise you to learn that the, 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 that the, young, the, young, the young folks in the crowd that decided to do the sit-in with me were, were Berkeley students, UC Berkeley students, nuclear engineering students, who decided to go into nuclear engineering because they're concerned about climate change. They're not UC Berkeley. That's Chris and Joey, two of my favorites. Um, and it's a very scary thing because you're not supposed to be arrested if you're going to go work at a nuclear power plant. So they were kind of like, ah. I was like, I'll talk to you. I'll send a letter to your bosses. It's going to be totally fine. Um, and it felt wonderful. We loved it so much that we decided that not only did we want our, head, our global headquarters, because there's three of us now, we need a global headquarters, um, we decided that we were going to rent office space in Berkeley. And both my, my main organizer and me had the same idea. We're like, we need retail space. You know, we don't want to be an office space. We want retail space. So we went to Berkeley and we're like, we want retail space. And sure enough, there was this one retail space around the corner from People's Park, four blocks from Sproul Plaza, where the free speech movement began in 1962. Um, huge windows, you know, um, incredible, great price, up and coming neighborhood. And then the real estate agent, she said, you know, she said, this is a retail space, you have to sell something here. And we were like, oh yeah, totally, environmental store. So we open our, I get our keys tomorrow and we open it. And that is where the revolution will continue. And this is Heather testifying Lance Commission against closing Diablo Canyon. Um, I took my daughter on the March 2. She's 10. I tried to explain to her. She went to Waldorf schools where like, they don't, really don't like nuclear power. They don't even like to immunize their kids there. Um, but they do like witches. There's a song that they sing about how the witches were really you know, not that bad or whatever. So when I told my daughter, we were, like, we're going to go do this march for nuclear power. And I said, nuclear power, it's like, how do I explain this to you, honey? I was like, it's like people think it's witches. And she goes, she goes, oh, OK. And I go, you know what the witches really were? And she goes, healers? And I was like, yeah, you got it. And so we all marched together. And we had our first victory in New York. Um, half victory, the headline on our press statement was, big victory for nuclear shows how far nuclear has to go. Because they still keep it. It's, like, it's kind of like a segregation for nuclear. Like, we'll give you a little credit for having a nuclear plant, but just, you got to stay over there. Don't be mixing with us real clean kids, solar and wind. But nonetheless, it was a victory, and we ate it up. We staged this photo like 20 times until we got it just right. Um, thank you very much.